Okay. The full title of my pres. Can you hear me? Can mm -hmm. everybody hear me? Okay. The full title of my presentation is Migration, Fear, and Compassion Practices Notes from Charnel Grounds. I want to divide it into three parts. Hopefully, they will be interrelated. In the first part, I want to talk about practicing in the charnel grounds that end at and loop back to and fro the US-Mexico border. There are particular kinds of charnel grounds that have been growing exponentially for many decades. In the second part, I want to share some of the compassion-focused and neuroscience-informed practices that I and two migrants engaged in and found helpful in working with and through suffering. And in the third part, I want to sort of make a plea for the development or the building of a compassionate capacity that is capable of discriminating between packaged and manipulative compassion and bodhicitta or great compassion. So first, a story about migrants, charnel grounds, and yours truly. Long ago, I, I spent a year practicing in various charnel grounds in India. There, I was surrounded by bones, scavenging animals, decaying bodies, you name it, it was there. I practiced day and night trying to offer my visualized shop body through the practice of chud for the benefit of all sentient beings. I can't say that I accomplished my offering task but I did find something in these burial grounds that I had never found before. I found the energy, the clarity of mind, and a special time space for my meditative practice. I cannot say that I fully or accomplished anything else, but I became hooked to these charnel grounds. When I came back to the US, I missed these grounds terribly. Strangely, I even missed the smell, the sights of bloody mass death, the mask of death, the experiences I uh, had in helping people who were dumping their bodies there. Uh, I even began to miss uh, the Tibetan practice of Hathor or sky burial that before had freaked me out when I had seen it ju performed just outside a small Tibetan village I was visiting. And I thought to myself, am I sick now? Why am I missing these charnel grounds? One day during a, a retreat here in the United States, I discussed uh, with one of my principal teachers, what was going through my mind about these journal grounds. It took no time for him to totally dismiss my complaints about not being able to practice as deeply as I wanted in the comfortable surroundings of my monastery and everyday life. He said, laughing, that I had further taken the Dharma very literally and um, he said, you live in a charnel ground and you're a routine visitor to many others. Why are you complaining? It's just that you don't recognize them. All you found in the charnel grounds of India, he continued, are similar charnel grounds to the ones that you're inhabiting now as we speak. Your mind, he said, is your charnel ground. For now, just go and smell the flowers. Yes, they're impermanent and always, always in a state of decay, but they're beautiful. As for your excellent cultivation of compassion in the charnel grounds, think again. Well, I grumbled for a few days, but the memory of the charnel grounds of India and my Dharma practice there kept resurfacing, no matter what my teacher said. Meditating in my room, I could not take my eyes from the outer rim of some Tibetan mandalas at the edge of my tankas. I don't know if anyone has seen that or everybody has. There are spots in which eight burial grounds are graphically depicted. I could no longer keep my eyes from the Sitapati tanka, which I had placed years before behind one of my altars. 
there I often found myself staring at the happy couple of the Lord and Lady of the Charnel Grounds. They reminded me of the charnel grounds that I had left behind. Months elapsed and my llama kept laughing at me. And to make things worse, he would often introduce me to other retreatants as the charnel ground helper. I was certainly not amused. Then all of a sudden, it happened. After years of working with immigrants and refugees, mostly in rather pleasant office psychiatry and community outreach settings, I was invited, pressured, cajoled to enter into the charnel grounds of countless of forced migrants. And when I did, there they were, migrants from all over the world, their collective karma of exile converging with mine, a migrant of long ago. And so it was that I eventually became unofficially la doctora, the therapist, the doctor in the streets, bars, community centers, private homes in Tijuana, Mexicali, and Tecate. The woman that could give migrants, wanted, wanting them or not, a document they could take to court, a paper that perhaps could help them cross over and stay indefinitely, and all this for free. Yes, there were many, too many to count, men, women, and children, forced to leave their karmic birth places by war, famine, and other violences. Migrants that had taken long flights that had been stowaways in transatlantic ships, migrants who walked thousands of miles only to live for months on the streets of these Mexican border towns hoping to get crumbs of bread from passerbys and a rickety bed in a hostel, often for more, more than one night. Migrants that had been held in cages well before Trump, while their kids lingered in still other cages or were lost in the field. Migrants that on the other side close by wore heavy ankle bracelets and perchance were able to legally stay in this strange and brutal promised land that they had sought. Their bodies, their bodies bore the wounds of rape and often were ravaged by long forgotten illnesses. Their speech was mostly halting and barely audible unless they were pushed to their limits when they had to demand the seemingly impossible to be treated as human beings. Migrant minds full of traumatic memories and troubled thoughts, cognizant both of the spirits of their ancient ancestors that had accompanied them on their long journeys and of the spirits of their loved ones that were buried somewhere on the long road to the border. Yes, I had finally found my charnel grounds for practicing the Dharma and for doing my Bodhisattva practices, helping others. The day I arrived, I was surprised by a rather uncanny coincidence, what some Jungians here may label as synchronicity. I bumped into a migrant lady holding a kind of skull cup full of tequila, which I had no option but to taste. When I asked her who the rest of the drink was for, she smiled and said, it is for La Santa Muerte, Saint Death. It will protect you. You must carry her near your heart. She smiled and pulled out of her purse a crumpled image of a wrathful dancing skeleton, which reminded me of my lady of the charnel ground. I still keep that image. It is bound with some Buddhist relics. So let me transition now to the second part of my presentation, the part about helping. I quickly began my migrant interviews and to prepare court briefs to support those seeking asylum, which mostly failed. Most of the asylum claims and other immigration claims were routinely dismissed or denied by the courts. This is before Trump and even under Obama. After their failure in court or even before arriving at the border, many of the migrants planned to unofficially cross with the help of a coyote. The price at that time varied per cross crossing. I 
I'm told that it is now about three times this. $2,000 for the first adult, $500 for the second, and $200 for each child. Of course, they could bring the price down with sexual tricks, giving up one of their children, making a deal that made them indentured servants for years, bringing in drugs, countless discounts indeed. Slowly I kept make, meeting people who began to call themselves mis pacientes, my patients, and some sought my help. I was elated with my helping project. I was fascinated with providing help. I would meet the migrants individually in couples and groups in street corners and little cafes and bars at shelters. And when I was finished with the formal interviews for the court assessment, that is all that I would do, meet with my fellow charnel round bodies. I began to ask my pacientes more directly how I could help them. And I will tell you about two of the requests I received. I met Olivia. She was a very tall, beautiful Jamaican woman in her mid thirties. I met her on the street. She asked me for a few pesos and that, so that she and her children could eat. She was a single mother and had traveled across oceans and dusty roads for months with her three children, seven, 12, and 13. When I gave her a few pesos and asked if I could help her in any other way, she looked at me intently and said, can you help me forget? I told her I was a therapist and forgetting bad things was something that I had done personally and helped others to do the same. We sat down in a small cafe and her children quickly joined us, but she told them to go and play on the sidewalk somewhere where she could see them. Then she said, I want to forget, but not everything. What exactly do you want to forget? I asked. The gang rape, she said. They gang raped me in Jamaica. I want to forget what they did, but not really. I want to remember who the guys were. Someday I'm going to back, go back there and see that they get what they deserve. So I don't want to forget them, but I want to forget how I feel. The problem is that my older boy knows well, that's a real problem. Someone told him and now he thinks I'm dirty inside and out. I also think I'm dirty. Even when I can bathe myself, I cannot get rid of the smell of the dirt, the dirt inside. Olivia then related the rape in vivid detail and how this was responsible for most of the dirt inside her and for the feelings her older boys had about her. She was agitated and talked for hours while the children played and played on the sidewalk. That day I told her I would try to help her. And two days later, I indeed started trying. I found a church that was open for anyone who wanted to pray. I asked the priest if I could do a therapy session or two or three hours each day for about a week. And he agreed. I had told Olivia that years before I had learned a fairly simple technique called memory reconsolidation. I loved that technique from the start. It was my favorite. I had used it with some other patients and paired it with some Buddhist techniques. Buddhist, she asked. Yes, I practice Buddhism, I said, and asked her if she had any problems with this. She laughed. No, I met a Buddhist monk in Jamaica and I liked him. He told me all about the Buddha and I liked what I heard except that the Buddha had left his family. And then we both agreed that was a little bit problematic. Olivia and I worked for a week on her gang rape memories using the memory reconsolidation approach, an approach that was designed to erase or at least contradict traumatic or problematic memories. I had learned this technique in Brazil in a course for therapists working with survivors of torture who wanted to forget to erase the pain and the shame they felt when they remember the circumstances in which they were tortured, tortured. But they wanted to remember the faces of their torturers. So one day they could back at, 
could get back at them and get justice. The approach is based on the notion that the consolidation of emotional memory, as was believed for almost a century, is not a one-time final process, and thus emotional learnings are not, as we know now, indelible. Rather, neural circuits encoding and emotional learning can be returned to a deconsolidated state, allowing erasure by new learnings before relocking or reconsolidation process takes place. Neuroscientists have also shown in several, but not conclusive studies, that after a learned emotion response has been eliminated, through a reconsolidation process, the patient still remembers the experiences in which the response was acquired, as well as the fact of having had the response. But the emotional response itself is no longer re-evoked by remembering these experiences. In sum, autobiographical memory is not impaired by the erasure of a piece of emotional memory. Working with Olivia with this approach and integrating in the process some instructions based on Nayan yoga, a very basic yoga based on the Kala Chakra Tantra, which has been rather effectively and carefully made a secular into a secular practice. According to Olivia, the imagery involved in this yoga practice made the process more credibly for her, for whatever reason. The last day we met, she recounted her gang rape, this time in a rather calm but fussy manner. She described for the first time her rapist, however, in detail, even the scar in one of the rapist's face. I never thought I remembered that, she said. And then she looked at me and said, no matter if they have plastic surgery, I will find them when I go back. The following week, I spent several hours a day with, uh, with Olivia at the church, working on other issues that seem important to her, as well as to me, more as a Dharma practitioner than as a therapist. We tried to work through Olivia's stated seeming incapacity of remembering instances when she was a recipient of kindness, sympathy, and validation. Early in our rather brief relationship, she would say, you have been the one and only person in my life who has helped me without wanting payment. But as we worked together, usually using visualization practices as well as a Japanese practice of gratitude called Naikan, she began to remember and accept that some people in her life had been kind to her and had validated her as a person on many occasions, even when all they had received in return from her was trouble. We also explored the various systems of oppression in which her life was embedded. Throughout, she was vibrant, eager, participating in the practices I had recommended. Upon leaving the church, I passed by a small house freshly painted and saw an old woman sitting on its porch next to a pot of flowers. I was walking fast and passed her by rather quickly. The woman called me in a loud voice and asked, Senora, no quiere oler mis flores. Lady, don't you want to smell my flowers? But my mind was on, on the memory of Olivia's process. I was exhausted, totally uninterested, and kept walking on. I said goodbye to Olivia and to her kids three weeks after I had met them. I never heard from them again. Thus, I never found out if the therapeutic process and Dharma practices that we engaged in together were of any use to her in the long run. The priest told me that after we stopped seeing each other, Olivia had gone back to the church several times. He had given her some food and she seemed very calm. He thought she had crossed the border, but he said, I'm really not sure so many people die here. Several days later, I met Arturo, who was sitting on a sidewalk, hoping to get a room at one of the hostels. He was an elderly man in his 70s and was suffering from considerable pain in one of his legs. An EMT from a passing fire truck 
had told him to go to the hospital and get it checked, but he did not want to leave the place where he was sitting because he thought if he stayed there until the evening, he could get a bed at one of the shelters across the street. I told him I would make sure he kept his place in line for the shelter bed. I would sit in his place and he could walk to a makeshift tent clinic that was only two blocks away. At first, he declined, probably because he was not sure he could trust me, but his pain convinced him otherwise, and he left me sitting in his place and headed for the clinic. He returned about three hours later. He was teary-eyed and told me that the doctor suspected that his pain was due to his uncontrolled diabetes and that he must lose his leg if he did not get to the hospital to be treated. He confessed that a doctor in El Salvador had told him he would probably need an amputation, but he could not afford to lose his leg. He had to join his son in Los Angeles. A coyote would be waiting for him in a week nearby to cross him over. Arturo's wife had died on the road and he had buried her only two days before. Quote, we were married 52 years and I was never unfaithful, he told me as he showed me his wedding ring. I miss her very much. You know, she almost made it. She is buried only an hour from here, walking time. Eventually, Arturo got his bed in the shelter and surprisingly for three nights, he was extremely happy for this. And by the time I left him, the pain medication that the clinic doctor had given him seemed to have worked. However, we agreed to meet the following day in the morning. He told me he was very sad and wanted someone to talk to. I was tortured, he said, and I can prove it by the government and by the Maras, referring to a brutal transnational gang that controls part of his country and several neighborhoods in the US. He handed me a paper that documented that he had been striking at the factory where he still worked. He also pulled up his shirt, which was full of blood. Mosquitoes and some bugs did this, he said. I noticed many bites in his arms as well as scars on his torso and on his back, he, the parts that he promptly attributed to having been tortured by the Maras. I promised I would see him in the late morning and invite him for lunch. He seemed happy then. I wished him a good night and I left. The following morning, I waited for him for an hour in front of the shelter. The shelter director came out and told me there had been a big fight inside the premises and that I could not go in until the police was through with their investigation. I asked him about Arturo and he said that as far as he knew, he was all right, but he was not sure. No one in the charnel grounds is ever sure of anything. Two hours later, Arturo came out and joined me and repeatedly apologized for being late. It's not my fault, he said. I know, I answered. He seemed a, a lot of pain again and was not in the mood to talk. He did not want to go to lunch. He stated firmly, he wanted to go and visit the grave of his wife. Can you help me? He asked. So a few minutes later, we took one of those informal taxis without seats that served the charnel ground. We headed south of Tijuana. It is here, he said, at the junction of the main highway with an unpaved road. We just have to wait for 10 minutes towards that tree and walk towards that tree. No more, he added. So we walked and we came to a mound that was where he said he had buried his wife a couple of days before. There were plenty of bones around, maybe human, maybe animal bones. I did not know, he did not know. Arturo sank to his knees and began to pray in a language I could not understand. It was not Spanish. After several minutes, he stopped and said, my wife was not Salvadorian, but indígena de Mexico, indigenous from Mexico. She taught me this prayer and told me to pray for her in this way if she died before I did. I have done this every night since she died. I still think her spirit is around here somewhere. She told me that spirits stay around waiting for someone to take them to their new home. So I came to get her. I was raised Catholic, he said, and we were told that when we die, we just go to heaven or to hell and that's it. 
but my wife had other ideas and I always respected them. He looked at me and he said, do you think her spirit is around here? I don't know, I said. Well, I can feel it, he said. What do you think? Can you feel her? Again, I said, no. I explained, however, that I was a Buddhist and summarized in as simple terms as I could the journey through the bardos of dying, death, and rebirth. He seemed fascinated and said that he would have liked to hear, that he would like to hear more of that. Could you do something for her? He asked, maybe pray. I said, I would try. I pulled my worn copy of the Bardo Todo, also known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, from my backpack, which I always carried during my sojourns into migrant charnel grounds. We sat next to the burial mound that housed Arturo's wife's body. The taxi driver soon joined us and simply said to Arturo, my mother was Zapoteca, Zapotec. I will pray in her language for your wife, senor. So we all prayed for an hour, maybe two, and then went back to TJ. The following day I met Arturo again. He was all smiles. He showed me his most prized possession, a cell phone. I'm in contact with my son, he said. He says not to worry going through the courts. It is of no use. He's picking me up here as I told you yesterday. He may cruza la linea, he crosses me the line. He will cross me to the other side. So we had lunch together and I dropped Arturo at his hostel and we said goodbye. Two months later, Arturo called me. He was in Los Angeles, living with his son and his wife and his kid and their kids and was getting very needed medical care. I might be able to keep my leg, he said. By the way, he added, can I ask you a favor? Can you get me a copy of your book of prayers in English? Mine was in Tibetan. I would like to say those prayers for my wife. Maybe if I did not pronounce her prayers right, she might listen to yours if they're in English. We both read a little bit of English when we were in El Salvador. I still think she's around, maybe as a spirit or as a baby, as you may say. I told him I could do better, that I could get him my Bardo Todo book in Spanish, something which I did. Arturo came to see me to my home office in Claremont. He wanted to work through his grief of losing his wife, of leaving his country, of seeing the plans that they had made together simply evaporate. I wish I could be back in time and home again, he told me many times, trying to conceal his anger. But that wasn't the beginning of his grief work, of the grief work we did together. And then quite suddenly, he became resigned to his loss. I wanted to find out why, but he didn't want to talk about it. He just said, there's nothing to go back to, and she's dead. Where she is, I do not know. I insisted on exploring these feelings, but he adamantly said no. Arturo now wor worked volunteering in Los Angeles Latinx community agency, a Latinx community agency that serves old people who live alone, whose children and other relatives have died or have been deported or simply have left them to fend for themselves. Arturo tried to explain that he was doing volunteer work in one phone conversation because he always tried to ignore other people in his country and then he went to Tijuana and everything changed. It is different now, doctora. I'm now paying attention to all the pain. All the pain I saw in Tijuana, you know, made a big difference. There's pain everywhere. In El Salvador, in Tijuana, in Los Angeles, no matter how many borders you cross, you always find the pain and it finds you. Arturo called me once a month for a couple of years and visited occasionally. He also referred people to me who like him crossed from the charnel grounds near the border to the charnel grounds of the promised land. Sometimes they just wanted to talk or advise or get advice on how to get a lawyer. Arturo often talked about preparing for his death and wanted me to help him to do so. 
But when he visited, we just would go walking to the nearby botanic gardens and share Cuban and Salvadorian jokes. I did not insist on doing therapy. Arturo died last week. These days, due to the pandemic and for other reasons too complex to discuss in this short period of time, I do not cross the border into Mexico, but I keep La Santa Muerte still with me bundled up in Buddhist relics, as I showed you. I make it self-available to those who have crossed from the still growing border charnel grounds. They want to work on their problems, on their traumas, but most of the time, they just want to hang out. I now have time to smell the flowers, and when it is possible, we'll go to meet the lady with the pot of flowers that I never stop to see. So the third part of my presentation, and the most brief of them, also begins with a story. One Dharma student from my monastery, the monastery where I teach, who is a BLM activist and a psychologist in training asked me recently where he could best develop the inner resources he was in need of. Resources that would enable him to hold and contain what was happening within himself and around him without being overwhelmed, especially in these charnel grounds. He said that he had heard that I privileged so-called charnel grounds as preferred sites for developing our compassion and engaging in compassion-focused practices. He said he was tired of studying at the university and doing retreats at the monastery. As a result, he had begun to conceive of one crime-ridden building project in Chicago that he had read about as a possible practice channel ground and moved to live there. I surprised myself in telling him, not so fast. I said that in my opinion, there are at least two distinct psychologies that are operative in showing us ways of developing and extending compassion to oneself and to the widest possible circle of beings. One of them stresses the opening and moving up towards suffering. In this psychology, the practices of attention to suffering, the deep contemplation of preliminary practices, the remembrance and acceptance of all lived experience in certain visualized tantric offerings for the benefit of all beings, to name a few of these practices, practices are key. This psychology seems to encourage that we seek to be in a helping mode at all times, to engage in these compassion-focused helping practices Certain charnel grounds, such as the migrant ones I lived in, literally speaking, are ideal practice sites. But the second psychology I told them is different. It focuses on first building what we may call a compassionate capacity. It stresses the need to first build our reserves and cultivate certain discriminating qualities before we throw ourselves headlong into opening to intense, overwhelming sufferings. Sufferings that we have not witnessed or experienced and for which we may be totally unprepared, even if we think we are. In building this compassionate capacity, we will seek to balance in our own minds and thus in the minds of others we interact with the horrors of extreme suffering, balance them with beauty, the beauty of the kindness of beings, the safeness of certain spaces, the flowers of the woman on the porch. All of these impermanent, yes, but present. Most important, this compassionate capacity will help us discriminate between what the Buddhist teacher Judith Leaf once said or called, prepackaged, manipulative, and heavy-handed compassion from bodhicitta, or true compassion. This compassionate capacity will encourage a deep comparative study of different methods that these days need to be informed not only by old time-tested Buddhist practices, but by the exciting neuroscience and psychotherapeutic developments 
that have begun to converge with Dharmic insights. These understandings will show up, and especially the people we work with, the fundamental role that body posture, breathing, movement, imagery, and somatic experiences have in our mind processes, mental suffering, and psychological healing. Yet this compassionate capacity should warn us of the increasing commercialized dharmic techniques being sold in the marketplace and conveniently stripped of any ethical foundations. The student asked if I had engaged in manipulative compassion, heavy-handed compassion. And I said, certainly, but hopefully not all the time. He smiled. Unfortunately, I'm convinced of my cautionary tale. My teacher invited us both for tea. And when we were finished, she looked at me and said, no charnel grounds for a little while. Just retreat in our compassionate retreat cottage. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Lourdes. Um, my original plan was to play the video of Aya, but I think it might be better to go from your talk to people here present responding to your talk. Um, so, um, Harriet Rye is joining us. She has a background in the psychodynamic tradition. At, um, she was at an institute and society in LA that was focused on psychodynamic work. And she's a Dharma teacher in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. And she's also a Red Cross uh, chaplain for disaster relief. And then Elaine Dove is a licensed professional counselor in Austin, Texas. And so she integrates clinical psychotherapy techniques like EMDR or um, the Tara approach for healing trauma. Um, and she's also a student of Tranga Rinpoche in the Karma Kagyu lineage. And she teaches um, Tonglen practice and Shamata practice. Um, and um, Stephanie Mines is a neuropsychologist who has done extensive training in Buddhist and Vedanta and other traditions, but she is not a, a student of one particular lineage at this point now. Um, she is more open to what uh, I've heard her say as the divine feminine, um, that, that, that's her practice. Um, and so, um, full disclosure, she was my therapist originally when, when I, um, did therapy in the early nineties and I was also learning meditation at that time. And so I felt, in a lot of ways, Stephanie was one of my first Buddhist teachers because she integrated the somatic trauma therapy work with meditation. And she encouraged me to explore uh, my interest in Buddhism and see how that could connect to my overall healing process. Um, and so she has developed uh, the Tara approach for resolving shock and trauma in individuals and families and communities. And she's also a vision holder for climate change and consciousness, which is an international collaboration of many different groups, including indigenous elders and um, um, healers of different traditions coming together. Um, and so, so they will be the three people on the panel with Lourdes that will be um, talking with each other. And so again, the general theme is what, what suffering do you see in your work as a caregiver and in the world in general? And then um, how can Buddhist approaches or other contemplative wisdom approaches help us to respond to the suffering that we are experiencing. Um, and so that's the general theme that we would like you to share on. Um, um, and also, of course, if you have just a spontaneous response for Lourdes that you want to share that may or not, may not fit in the exact box of the topic, that's also perfectly fine. Um, 
So let's see, Stephanie, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, and I'm gonna stop the video of other folks on the screen that are not in the panel, so we are, so our uh, image can just be of the people uh, on the panel. Okay, so just one second. Okay, um, I don't know why, but I'm drawn to asking Harriet to speak first. Are you okay going first, Harriet? Yes. Thank you, John. Up no, as I first knew you um, <laughs> at uh, Plum Village in France. Um, we discovered we were Vassar graduates <laughs> and um, they came very close. And um, while I was there, I I uh, was deeply moved by the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, which I want to study more closely. But first, I would like to say congratulations to you, John, for the vision and the breadth of this conference. I think it is a wonderful contribution and um, a wonderful opportunity for Sangha building in the healing community and for also introducing to us to Lourdes and your beautiful practice so moving and um, very, very heartful and I will not forget it at all. Um, and these two brave and uh people that you, I like. So um, my practice, I, I'm, a, I'm a psychoanalyst by training and so it was a very formal training and certainly did not keep any of my personal beliefs in that for a long time. But um, after I was uh, deeply involved in the, in the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, having met him in the 1980s for the first time, um, I was invited to organize a conference at UCLA in 2007, which as far as I know was the first conference on mindfulness and psychotherapy in the US. And we, we were able to bring Thich Nhat Hanh, it was a, a three-day conference, Thich Nhat Hanh and about 40 monastics to UCLA and uh, Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield and Trudy Goodman and um, um, Dan Siegel and others for very rich practice. And it, it opened my heart for the first time that this was my practice that I considered my personal health mechanism to work with difficult patients was actually something that should be shared in the practice. Um, so that was a transformation in my work. Um, and I have worked with deeply, deeply troubled uh, patients, often with trauma. And um, I have found that introducing mindfulness practices and meditation and gathas um, have have complete and also beginning each session with three bells and an opportunity to breathe deeply just moved things along so much more um, deeply and meaningfully than the slow process of psychoanalysis um, and so with all my patients uh, I, I have introduced my practice and meditation we meditate together, we listen to the bell, um, and we share um, deep listening and an opportunity to come into the present moment. Um, most in the last three years, I've been uh, a ketamine therapist also working with PTSD patients um, with recalcitrant depression. And it has been phenomenal. I mean, some of these were patients that I've worked with for a long time and we made headway, but it seemed very slow. And with the ketamine, with a, um, and I don't know if any of you have had any experience with it yourselves or in your practice, but the trans transcendent visions and, and opportunities to experience life in another in another mindset free of the baggage of trauma and suffering, coupled with 
meditation and somatic awareness in the journey, in the ketamine journey, has been really extraordinary. I'm very, very pleased with the way things are going. Um, when you talk about the way in which people are suffering, of course, right now, COVID comes to mind and the experiences of isolation and depression that many patients bring and the fear and that the, uh, the polarizing political climate is also extremely traumatic for many patients, um, feeling that there is, there's no one sort of guiding the ship in a, in a safe and thoughtful direction. Um, so I think for me, the Buddhist practices of sitting, listening deeply, encouraging meditation and um, practicing metta and loving kindness and, and compassion um, and Tonglen have been very supportive in this. And with that, I will bow to my fellow panelists. Um, Stephanie, would you like to go next? Are you ready? Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say to Lourdes how full my heart is from what you share. Uh, I uh, may not be able to say much more because the tears are just ready to fall. I can't fully even explain the magnitude of connection that I feel with your mission and the beauty of your writing, the beauty of your capacity to bring full visuals into my body of these precious beings. I have taught for many years in Mexico, and it is a, a source of grief to me that I can't return there at this time. And the connection that you reinvigorated in me is both personal and deeply spiritual. So I thank you for sharing your experience. So your uh, question, John, uh, suffering is the pandemic and it's now finally clear to us as Lourdes so beautifully described that we are living in a charnel ground and we have been for a long time but it's now so obvious that even the denial of it is seen as a response to the magnitude of pain that is everywhere. Our entire culture is finally disintegrating as it must. The extractive greed of humanity is taking its toll and everyone is affected. Even those who in their privilege think that they're not. So it's from my standpoint, a function of my guidance to choose carefully where I engage my sacred activism for me, just because of who I am, uh, retreating doesn't seem to be an option. Uh, I have to engage. Uh, I have to engage with my words, with my touch, with a mission that has always been the foundation of my work, which I call sustainable health. I'm not sure it's a very good title, but it represents 
a groundswell of compassion. I hope it is truly compassion to empower at the grassroots level with the resources that will allow people to make a difference in their own nervous systems from experience that I have as a survivor of sexual abuse, as a survivor of domestic violence, as a survivor of political torture, having lived through the radical and violent attempts to make a revolution, I have come to this revolution uh, and attempt to focus what resources I have on imparting effective, practical, transformative healing potential at the grassroots level. So after being and still am a licensed clinical psychologist, a neuroscientist, uh, someone who conducted clinical trials, I have walked away from structures that I feel are not effective, that I feel are manipulative and authority-based and gone where I always wanted to be, which is in the groundswell. And this is, I admit, how I deal with my own unbearable pain about what is happening everywhere around me, all the things that Lourdes so artfully described. The writing itself, I believe, is compassion in action, sacred activism. The only way I can make it to not disintegrate in the face of the suffering that is exacerbated is through my sacred activism. That's what allows me to not lose it. So, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Elaine, I can, I, yeah, are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lourdes. I'm the child of a war refugee, so I was reflecting upon all of that as you were speaking. Um, not a story I lived, but my mother and her siblings lived, and I'm a direct product of that. I'm a direct product of uh, someone having to flee, being displaced being a refugee in another country under very unfortunate circumstances. So it's a familiar story, perhaps not firsthand, but very close to that. Yeah. As someone who grew up as someone who suffers the ongoing and, and relentless trauma of permanent displacement from your home culture and your family. Yeah. So it's a, it's a subject of reflection, especially as I currently see Americans scoping out their options for fleeing to other countries. It's ironic in some ways. So I would say that I am primarily a dancer and a shamanic healer. Um, I actually obtained a counseling license because it was the only way that people could actually find me. Um, I have a very uneasy relationship with my field in certain ways, and particularly with the relentless exclusion of non-white people and indigenous people from my profession. Um, it is an ongoing thing of contemplation to me whether or not that is something I want to challenge and change within our profession. And in fact, the relentless exclusion of non-white people from pretty much all of the power structures in this country, including those within Buddhism, the way that it has been set up. Yeah, so this is an ongoing thing that perhaps I sit with more than do anything about a lot of the time. But I will say that it plays out in terms of the fact that most of my clients are non-white people. They are women, they are people of indigenous descent, they are uh, 
LGBTQ individuals, this kind of thing. So the mainstream person is generally not who I serve, although I live within an extremely uh, white and very non-diverse city. So those people find me and I work with them. And a lot of what I sit with is the primary and secondary suffering caused by their exclusion, the exclusion of their wisdom from the society and the harm that that is actually doing to our society to not be able to include those voices and those faces in ways that they need to be included for the healing that is needed to happen. So in addition to being a therapist, which I always feel like I have to put quotes about because I feel that I'm a healer and a therapist is just a piece of paper. I don't necessarily need the piece of paper to do what I do. It just helps people find me on Google, basically. There's a piece of paper disappeared tomorrow. I would still keep doing what I've been doing my whole life. <laughs> it wouldn't be that different actually, you know? Um, yeah, I just wouldn't have to like, you know, make up, put numbers on pieces of paper or if I ever have to do that, which happily don't, not many people ask me for. But I think about that a lot, about the exclusion, how exclusion is a form of suffering that is felt only by the people that are excluded <laughs> to some extent. And then the ones who do the excluding, like don't actually feel that pain. But I think it is a pain. The pain is the loss of that wisdom, not having that wisdom available, not having that richness, and then how a society dies without that, without that inclusiveness. But it is not a pain that's maybe directly felt. It's maybe like more in an indirect way. So what were your other questions, John? You said, how do I see suffering? What else? <laughs> um, yeah, what's the suffering you see in your work? And then how? Yeah. And Buddhist or other other wisdom traditions, contemplative based traditions respond, um, and so then that could also include um, when is it useful to use a clinical license, and when is that an obstacle or something that gets in the way, um, or just speaking about yeah the wisdom traditions you've been connected to and mm -hmm. ways that you are um, embracing suffering through those traditions or, or mm -hmm. visions that you may have of other ways that that could occur. Mm -hmm. Sure, so I'm a student of Chagra Rinpoche's. I haven't seen him in a long time because he's old. He doesn't really travel here anymore. When I, when I can, I go down and I get, I get hits from uh, Paula Rinpoche because he comes to San Antonio. Um, and then I've managed to make it up to Crestone a couple of times to spend time with Rinpoche's teachers, whoever is in residence there. That's been good. In terms of just it being a very straight, my experience of Chandra Rinpoche has always been that he's very straightforward. He's very earthy. He's very straightforward. It's very simple. And if you don't get it, he says, ah, you know, keep thinking about it. Come back later. So I've been doing that for probably nearly 30 years. <laughs> this point, which is no, sort of, sort of great. <laughs> and I, I have understood some things, as a matter of fact. You'd probably be proud. Um, you know, the emails I used to send to him as a younger student, I still laugh about this now. It's kind of great. So, but I should say also that I'm a dancer. I'm a moving person. I'm a Feldenkrais person, and I've been a dancer since I was a teenager. I'm 51 now, so I've been dancing around 30 years. And then in 2018, I had the great good fortune to accompany a, a good friend of mine to the Kalahari bush out in northeastern Namibia and actually go back to basically our genetic blueprint and learn the Kalahari healing dance from the actual indigenous healers that still live, up, live out there, from, of whom there are not very many left. And so I was very fortunate that my friend is a good friend of these healers and has known them for 50 years. And she took me out there and I spent a month learning healing, the healing dance from them. So there's always been a lot of, a lot with um, physically based practice. And if people are willing to go there, I'm, I'm absolutely willing to take them there. But it really depends on if they want it, you know, because, I, because what those healers taught me is that in order for healing to be received, it has to be requested. It ha someone has to, you can't ever impose a healing. That doesn't work. It must be asked for. Yeah. And 
they had a very simple, straightforward approach, which resonated with me, which is that they simply live in whatever their village in. If you need something, you just go talk to the village healer. And I feel like for me, that's very much how I do things. You know, that, you know, I work, I have a little space at my home that I work out of. People know I'm around. Sometimes people come and knock on my door. I do hang out, you know, there are a couple of chairs on the porch, things in the back. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of hanging out time that goes on with indigenous healers. You hang out a lot. And so that's what I finally realized was missing when I came back from Africa is we do this clinical thing, but we like don't ever hang out with people. And then I was like, well, that's no wonder it like feels exhausting and weird. And so then I started creating an informal like shamanic people's group where I just thought, well, what if I put a bunch of healers together and we just hang out? Because the other thing was that I noticed that the indigenous healers spent a lot of time hanging out with each other. They would just go off into the bush and just hang out like, like brothers. There were these two old healers and their wives that I worked with. And I thought, oh, you know, we don't do that here either. Like we don't hang out with each other as healers. So I started doing an experiment on that, which has been going for about a year. It's absolutely great. There's about 30 healers in our tribe now from all different, all different sort of kinds of traditions and things that people do. And we just, we hang out. And it's kind of great. And I think there's so much about that that's like, miss. that's the thing that's missing from this culture. It's just hanging out with each other without having to do. This constant focus on doing and getting work done is just destructive. It's absolutely destructive. And so because of that stuff, I've kind of let it go of this idea of having therapeutic goals. <laughs> because I'm not sure what we're actually doing sometimes when we're, I mean, I know we come in, we have problems we need to solve. But the truth is, a lot of times those problems get solved by simply hanging out. So I'm at, maybe in a place where I'm kind of re-examining a lot of the things I learned as a professional counselor. I'm thinking, yeah, I've never thought that worked, but why didn't I think it worked, right? And I feel like I'm returning more and more to this kind of earthy village healer approach, mm -hmm. especially in the pandemic, because honestly, that's what seems to work for people is simply having ways and places to hang out safely or to learn how to meditate in a simple way or just to be in the presence of someone who is stressed as they are, but friendly and welcoming. So I question whether, just as happens with many, many things in this country, whether my field has simply become kind of ossified and is simply has boxed itself in and is unable to grow in ways that are vital because of just this whole focus on this thing called treatment. That's a discussion I would love to have ongoingly with other practitioners who have that same question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why what you're doing is interesting because I'm like, you know, there has to be more room for that kind of communal environment somehow because that in many ways is really the thing that heals people and it's good to do this other work i mean it's good to do a shamanic session it's good to teach someone a warrior dance it's good for them to do a healing dance and go into a trance and all these things but then if they go back out and they don't have a place to hang out with other people who have had those kinds of experiences and integrated it kind of gets lost and then they come back and they want to do it again over and over and over, but then I'm like, so where's the sustainability part? And I say this because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ayahuasca in my area. There's a lot of ayahuasca, a lot of hallucinogen type stuff. And I, and people go and they do these things over and over and over again, but the result doesn't sustain, it doesn't hold. And so they repeat, 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 repeat. And I'm like, so what is it that, that the container doesn't hold? And I feel like that's the thing going on in our whole society is that the container is not holding somehow. It's like we have a gallon jug made of paper full of water or something. And, and so, I, I mean, I think about Stephanie's work, you know, about how that's a sort of like, you know, strengthening just like the container of like your energetic body to hold yourself, right? But then there must also be something about how we, how we hold each other in community as healers and also with people coming for healing. I would love to share the sustainable health model with you, Elaine. Elaine and I haven't connected in quite a while. Um, she has studied and practices the TAR approach. Uh, and 
I have just, there's a film that's on the brink of being released that provides a sustainable health model, which is a culturally competent, culturally informed model that incorporates the area that I feel I've devoted so much attention to, which is the interface between physiological suffering and emotional, spiritual, and psychological suffering. Uh, so that we're able to address suffering holistically. We don't exclude the body. This is one reason why I really had to liberate myself from the strictures of licensure that separated mind and body. I'm still a licensed clinical psychologist, and I still use that when I can. And I absolutely reference my clinical trials. Uh, they give credence to the wildness in me. Uh, but the wildness is closer to the truth than the clinical trials. It was a huge sacrifice for me to stay in the kind of space I had to be in to conduct those trials, but I did it. Uh, I did it with uh, autism. I did it with aphasia. I did it with traumatic brain injury. And um, I did it with stroke. Those were difficult clinical trials, uh, and they were difficult for me personally to hold myself in that much. And I'm glad I did it. I don't regret anything uh, in my highly diverse past because I've extracted so much learning from all of that. And that learning has to do with this interface between physiology and human suffering and how we can meet people in that place. I teach a touch, applied touch, gentle system that I was fortunate enough to learn from a woman named Mary Eno Burmeister, who is now an ancestor. And uh, Mary was the direct recipient of what I consider to be a terma, really, that came from a man named Jiro Murai in Japan. So Jiro Murai received this ancient teaching, which is documented in uh, Kojiki, uh, which is a book written in an ancient kanji uh, that is virtually untranslatable at this time, though it has been translated by scholars. And Jiro Murai himself did study, he uh, both, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. When he died, he was in a Zen monastery. He was a Zen priest. So there is a Buddhist association with this very gentle, easy to learn, though profound healing system that Mary transmitted to me uh, and which I have adapted specifically for the nervous system. And I am also a student of Trungpa Rinpoche, and I traveled with him uh, in Nepal. And when uh, one of his monks was quite ill with respiratory distress, Trungpa Rinpoche uh, called on me to uh, teach uh, the monks how to treat him. <laughs> and we had a plan uh, for me to return and do more teaching. He had uh, uh, a clinic in Boda. Uh, that was just starting to evolve at that time. And I feel uh, just deeply grateful for all the teachings I've received from Rinpoche. And perhaps one of the most profound ones was uh, I was traveling with my small daughter uh, on one trip with him. Uh, and this is so funny. Uh, I was, she was still in diapers. And I was carrying the bag, we were on the bus, and I was carrying the bag uh, with the diapers. And as I was exiting the bus and Rinpoche was standing there, the bag with the diapers dropped <laughs> at his feet. And I was just humiliated and devastated and scurrying to clean up this horrible mess. And Rinpoche so beautifully said, don't worry, don't worry, you are doing the most important work. You are caring for your daughter. That is the most important 
spiritual work you could be doing. And the way he lifted that burden of shame off of me uh, is an unforgettable in my humble life act of compassion. So I feel that the Buddhist teachings absolutely weave their way into everything that I do. And what I loved about what Lourdes was relating was this weaving, this interface of Catholicism, Zapoteca, everything coming together uh, in bringing healing in a culturally sensitive, fluid, and improvisatory way, meeting the suffering where it is. Uh, and that was, that was a blessing for me to hear you relate that, Lourdes. Mil gracias, mi amor. Thank Mil you. gracias, mi vida. Well, I have a secret uh, from, uh, about Trangu Rinpoche. Uh, he was the teacher of my refuge, Lama Jamalong Kontro Rinpoche, and he was my, and, and I've taken many teachings from Rinpoche, both in Nepal and in India. Rinpoche likes to hang out in hot tubs. So he would actually call, uh, I used to live in the Idlewild Mountains, in the mountains where the town of Idlewild is, and he would announce that he was coming to lead a retreat there and wanted me to make sure to have my hot tub ready. <laughs> so one time I was going to study with him in Nepal and uh, the hostel where I used to stay, everything was full. And the only thing that was, you know, open for me to stay was this very expensive Hyatt hotel. And I said, I'm not going to go to Nepal and stay at a Hyatt. And, I, you know, so I told Gloria, his secretary, I'm not, you know, and she says, oh, no, Rinpoche wants you to stay at the Hyatt. I said, why would Rinpoche want me to stay? There's a great hot tub there. <laughs> and he would like to use it. <laughs> you know? So I did. <laughs> Paid a lot. And he hung out <laughs> in the hot tub for three or four days in a row. So. So next time either of you see him, send him my regards. He'll remember me not so much for being a good student, but because <laughs> gave him access to hot tubs. John, I don't know how much time we have, but it's so enlivening to hear everyone, and I feel very stimulated. So maybe you could tell us if we are out of time, or can we keep uh, up? Well, uh, we technically have 15 minutes left, and I wanted to play the video of Ayo, which is a 15-minute video. How about uh, Elaine? Doesn't isn't Elaine speaking or no? Uh, Elaine is not speaking. Elaine has spoken, but Elaine okay, is Elaine. Uh, scheduled okay. for another. Uh, yeah, that's one of the hardest parts of this job is how to having yeah. to not have people that <laughs> could have a lot to say as well. Um, but Elaine and Steph Stephanie's going to give a talk on Sunday evening, and then Elaine will be responding to that talk. So then um, that will be a space where we can hear from her about this topic and other topics. Um, so yeah, if everyone's OK, then we, we can play this video. And then um, Stephanie has agreed to lead us in a, a somatic attunement practice. Um, and then we'll have a break uh, for lunch and um, uh, what have you. Um, so does that work for everybody? That's good? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'll share my screen for the video. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think I would say that it just uh, feels like we, we all have more to say, and that means there need to be more conferences and more opportunities to uh, yes. be stimulated yeah. by each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's my hope is that this conference is just the beginning of a long conversation that we'll be having the rest of our lives, hopefully, and uh, <laughs> uh, that each each panel can, um, the option is to, to form a committee and, and then so that committee can be a space where we can continue sharing with each other and also um, we can create a journal in which we can offer writings that we can all read and then also a YouTube channel and a podcast. So, um, so this, the idea is this is the appetizer that 
uh, makes you want to eat more later. Yeah. And you haven't shared with them the food truck. Right. Yes. Uh, Loris and I are working with some folks to create a worker cooperative, a contemplative care worker cooperative, and and, buy um, a food truck. and also another co-op that we want to create that would be a food truck. And so the the worker cooperative advisor said you should keep them separate because it makes it easier to deal with the the books. You know, so we'll have two separate cash registers, but um, in terms of actual uh, way that it's where we're offering being with each other is a, a food truck could pull up at a church or a Buddhist temple and um, um, have food and then also music and a way of being together. And then we could also have tents set up in which we could do counseling or meditation or different kinds of workshops. Nice. Yeah. Good. Maybe you have a third crash register where you get Dharma points. It doesn't actually ring up any money, but just, like, uh, <laughs> you know, it spits out glitter or like, you know, little flowers <laughs> right. or like poems. I, 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 I think <laughs> one, of the, one of the antidotes to suffering is community. Uh, the joy yeah. of being together, the joy of one another. So I like your ideas for propagating yeah. that. Yeah. It all has to do with embodied practice, <laughs> bringing yes. our bodies into connection and yeah. into our absolutely. Um, okay, so I'll play the video from Ayo. Uh, so I'm gonna mute everybody just so we don't get any other background noise. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this panel on Buddhist counseling and Buddhist informed psychotherapy. Uh, we are fortunate today to have Dr. Pamela Ayo Yatende to be uh, sharing um, her perspective on this topic. And so Ayo has a PhD in pastoral counseling, and so she trains in pastoral counseling in, um, is, it, is it the Care and Counseling Center of Georgia? Is that the right? Okay, and, and, and so the THD program that she did was, which was at Chandler? Uh, it, uh, it was actually called the Atlanta Theological Association, which was a combination of Chandler School of Theology at Emory University, Interdenominational Theological Center known as ITC, and mm -hmm. Columbia Theological Seminary, where I graduated from. Right, and this program was, um, an integration of both pastoral counseling and psychotherapy? Yes. Um, so, um, so what I'm interested in exploring today in this panel is um, how can Buddhist caregivers engage in more clinical counseling practice, clinical counseling work? And um, so I'm interested in we think of clinical pastoral education that's a clinical training for religious workers to provide um, spiritual care for people um, and then if we think of say psychotherapy that in integrates mindfulness or other contemplative practices um, into its work that that's another approach that has been established um, and so then I'm, I'm interested in, in what uh, a Buddhist caregiving role would be that integrates the religious caregiving work as well as the psychotherapy caregiving work. Um, and so what kind of uh, space do we need for that kind of exploration to happen? Um, and what, what do you think are some of the um, pros and cons of doing that kind of exploration or what are the potential benefits and also maybe the potential pitfalls that we need to think about. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you for inviting me to be on the panel in this way. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be with you this weekend. I'm moving from St. Paul, Minnesota to Chicago, Illinois this very weekend. So uh, I'm excited about this uh, gathering. Uh, as most of you probably know, it is long overdue. 
And uh, so here we are. And thank you, John, for uh, your leadership. So I, I went through CPE and I also did a three and a half year residency in pastoral counseling. And I think as Buddhist practitioners, uh, Buddhist practitioners who want to be more clinically um, skilled, there's no way around that, but go actually going through clinical training. That's what we have to do. Um, not only because I think it's uh, beneficial for us to do that, but also because there's nowhere we're, where we're going to work <laughs> that is not going to require us to be skilled clinically. So CPE or clinical pastoral education uh, is, is uh, critical and important for uh, those of us on the path to becoming board certified chaplains, but also becoming certified and uh, licensed counselors. If we don't put ourselves in clinical situations, and by that I also mean pluralistic situations where we are working with uh, clinicians uh, and working with non-Buddhists and also working with people who supervise our work, how else will we know uh, whether what, we do, what, what we're doing is efficacious and does this actually work? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in evidence-based practices but not at the exclusion of, of Buddhist practices that aren't necessarily put under the spotlight for examination. So I think what we can, what we can bring at this moment is the desire to be skilled scientifically, but also bring to bear some of the things that we know are helpful in uh, Buddhist practices. For example, uh, loving kindness meditation. I know that there's a study that's been uh, done, hasn't been published yet, but has been completed at the University of Minnesota. Um, it was just presented at Caring Bridge, so I got to see part of this uh, presentation. And I said to them, even though it hasn't been published yet, I think that uh, people who practice loving kindness meditation would love to know more about your findings. So there's, uh, there's opportunity for us, and there's the only way through uh, clinical education is actually just going through it. And I, I wouldn't recommend that we create something different. However, what I do think we should do is advocate for more Buddhist practitioners to be supervisors. Because if we have more Buddhist practitioners who are supervisors, then we can all share in this pluralistic clinical experience, but with supervision that speaks to us. Right, so then, um, so you're, uh... Your suggestion, your view would be to work with the ACPE, the Clinical Pastoral Education um, Organization, as um, the organization that could provide the clinical training, provide the, the clinical um, way of doing that kind of training, um, um, and but having more Buddhist theory and practice be um, part of that training by having supervisors who have training in, in Buddhist theory and practice? Yes. And actually, we could take that upon ourselves to get that training. I think that would be a, an interesting project for us to embark upon. And, and actually, why not do it? Years ago, what was it? I don't know how many years, 15, 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago, mm -hmm. a Buddhist in spiritual care advocated for an opening uh, for us. And it's been opened. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have heard that our presence tends to enrich the experience. So why not step forward and enrich? Right. right. And then um, I know you've been, you were a member of the American Association of Pastoral Counselors, which has um, since merged with ACPE. And, um, and so could you say more about how, the, how that merging has happened and what kind of training the ACPE is doing now based on the influence of the AAPC folks that are working there. Yeah, so I'll say briefly that I wasn't part of any of the planning around that and I didn't participate in the merger conversations, though I did vote in favor of the merger. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that uh, the, the culture of, of the American Association for Pastoral Counselors, AAPC, has 
somewhat morphed within the structure of ACPE to present now what, what we're calling a spiritually integrated psychotherapy training. It's brand new. I'm gonna offer it in the next few months, but basically it's what AAPC was under the auspices of ACPE. So it's like a smaller organization, but has been around for a long time, informing what has been uh, primarily a chaplain organization to expand beyond chaplaincy into psychotherapy. And um, so what do you think about, um, if you were a supervisor uh, for the ACPE um, and you were supervising folks to do clinical uh, caregiving as Buddhists, um, um, would you change or want to modify how the um, AAPC or ACPE normally does training because of your Buddhist background that, that you might want to approach it in a different way? Um, and how, yeah, and, and how would that work? Yeah. Right. Well, I haven't thought deeply about how it would change, mm -hmm. but you know, just instinctively, because Buddhists think differently about the, the human being than Westerners do, that there has to be some change. Uh, for example, you know, what role does Buddhist anthropology play in understanding the human being? Not only the way our mind works, which we've, you know, we've studied that, but also how, what the body is. Um, and what's the connection between mind body from a Buddhist perspective? And what is the relationship between these two bodies or the body of the counselor and the group that's uh, engaged in psychotherapy? What is that relationship between those people from a Buddhist perspective? You know, for example, does it make sense to talk about uh, transference and countertransference? Is it really that linear? Does it really start at the point of, of two people meeting? And does it begin with the person who is the counselee? I mean, these kinds of questions, right? Uh, I don't think that we're as linear as Western, Western thinkers are. And that probably has some implications for you know, who is the counselee, who is the counselor at any given point. Um, things like that, I think, would be worthy of discussing. And, and that's um, coming from your experience with meditation and also providing counseling for folks. Uh, is, that where, is that where you were coming from with that idea? Or? I guess you could say that. It's kind of off the cuff. <laughs> it, it may be me reading your mind, you know. <laughs> um, that, that's very much, that's very much uh, something I think about a lot is when I'm working with someone, I'm... Um, the experience of being in the room with someone and what I experience in my body and, and what is it that's coming from my own experience and what is it that's arising because of the relational experience I'm having in the present moment with someone um, and how can that, when there's that kind of attunement, um, is, is, are the terms transference and countertransference still relevant or is there some other term for it or, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, from a, from a Buddhist perspective, we would say all these words are, are constructs. The words themselves are not the reality, but are pointing to something. But if what we want to do is really immerse ourselves in a Buddhist informed uh, uh, education, um, for example, sometimes we talk about Buddhism and psychotherapy. Well, Buddhism is a form of psychotherapy in my view. So how do we explain that uh, to people who want to learn more about how we do what we do? Yeah, that, that was a, um, um, I, so I did uh, pastoral counseling training at the Kleinville Institute at Claremont School of Theology, and, and so it was spiritually integrated psychotherapy. And so the feeling was that it was, psychotherapy was the foundation of what we were doing. Um, but then, yeah, I was thinking, well, uh, Buddhism is also a psychology, so um, is it possible to have Buddhist psychology be more of the foundation, um, but, that, but that is integrating the whole clinical experience and wisdom? That's, yeah. 
Yeah, for example, you know, I, I think that the Noble Eightfold Path may be um, the very first form of what we now call CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean with a capital C, capital B, capital T, but obviously uh, the Noble Eightfold Path is about how we think, right, cognitively, uh, behavioral, what we do, and the point of it is to uh, help ease our suffering. That's the therapeutic part of it. Right. Can I yeah. ask a question, John? Feeling in terms of like sure. somatic trauma therapy. Sure. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, Pamela, I, just a practical question. Let's suppose somebody wanted, who's a Buddhist, uh, I'm just giving myself as an example, not that I'm going to do this, but I have a, aside from my PhD, I have, a, which is an interdisciplinary PhD, I have my master's in counseling psych. But I was trained in India and in Nepal, you know, um, but I would not be eligible to do CPE. Isn't that correct? Um, yeah, that would be that you would have to go through the formal channels of the Association of Clinical Pastoral Education to become board certified. Yeah, I would have to have an MDiv. That would be the only degree, wouldn't it? Um, I'm not sure if that's. I think in general that is for sure. Most people who do it are um, have an MDiv degree, but I'm not sure if everyone has to have an MDiv degree. Yeah. I think to get CPE you have. Now, I may be wrong. I never applied or anything, but mm -hmm. uh, that really then restricts people who have M MAs in dance therapy or in, uh, you know, counseling psychology or, or, or any other actually clinical degree, but doesn't have an MD and then div. So to have only that route is is problematic for buddhist counselors i mean that's just yeah john sure yeah i just you know in terms of being able to do cpe you don't have to have an mdiv no no i don't have an mdiv and i've done four units of cpe what kind of degree do you have i don't have any degree oh, okay this is wonderful <laughs> that corrected um, I mean, there, there's the Buddhist equivalency that you can acquire through the white papers, which I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but, but it is not required to do any units of CPE. That's open to anyone. Oh, great. Really? Well, I stand, uh, it was just a question. I stand right. corrected. I had asked one time for, for a former student of mine here in Los Angeles uh, with Father Chris, actually, uh, that had the CPE program that served LA County and stuff like that. And I was told that, that you needed an MD, but I may have misunderstood. Um, so I think it's the idea of kind of like practical nuts and bolts in terms of if you want to do this work, uh, how can you make a living? And then does, so does some clinical training help you, um, be considered eligible to do the work and qualified to do the work. Um, but yeah, that this balance of if, if you, yeah, should it be, it, it, it could be more than one way of doing that clinical yeah. training. Yeah. It doesn't just have to be ACPE, it could be other things. So that's one topic that yeah. this association could explore is, yeah, what are the different pathways in which people can different pathways and yeah. deinstitutionalize some of it. Yeah. Um, someone sent a question in that is speaking to this. So, so the person says, I'm really resonating with the need just to hang out as a therapeutic mode. How do we reconcile that with the need to make a living as a therapist? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll speak to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this cultivating a uh, a lot of professional hanging out going on. Yeah. Uh, you, you start by hanging out 
and from there your community builds and you people get to know that you're a healer who does this thing and then you're connected to other healers who also do other things and your name gets around and people start showing up at your door because they heard from your community that you were that person who does that thing so if you need a curse extraction you see elaine if you need to talk to the dead you see danny if you need to like, you know, do EMDR, you probably come see me. But if you need some hypnotherapy, you go see Zaylin. It's like a village. What we try to do in the West that doesn't work is we try to build all these structures without the village. You can't do that. We actually have to practice the village as a practice. From there, everything grows. Everyone in my healing tribe is making it through the pandemic with making money with their skills because we've built the village. Mm -hmm. So you start, I, th I think the village is a practice. I think it's the practice that this, this culture needs. Mm -hmm. And we want to ignore that part and shortcut to how do we make a paycheck? You can't do that. You must no, build I, the village I, I first. You're right. And, you know, uh, I think there could be institutional forms of getting degrees and licenses and so forth, but there needs to be other deinstitutionalized spaces yes. that really don't demand these kinds of licenses, but people have other skills and other gifts and things like that. It doesn't have to be saints and, and everything like that. I, I want to make a, a plea for something. We're calling this Buddhist. Uh, as a Tibetan Buddhist, um, I studied a lot. Actually, some of my Tibetan Buddhist teachers didn't like it, but I did it nonetheless with bond teachers. And uh, the Bon is the Greek Buddhist tradition of Tibet. And, uh, and they have amazing healers and healing practices that are not, have not as yet been integrated into the Buddhist tradition. And His Holiness Dalai Lama sort of named Bon the seventh uh, school of, I mean, the seventh school of the Tibetan uh, tradition. And, uh, and I think maybe this could be Buddhist slash Bon association. Mm, that's and nice. bringing some Buddha Bon practitioners and, and teachers. Um, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would also say I, I agree with Io about the foundational importance of good clinical training as part of the work because I feel that it has been so important. And I also come from a very classical uh, fundamental training um, and have had the freedom. I'm just celebrated my 80th continuation day. So I've been around for a long time. And, and I think that the, the older and wiser I become, I started as a feminist and sort of tried to turn over the apple cart in psychoanalysis um, to uh, really emphasize the pre-verbal mother baby foundational importance of of our development and so forth and adding to that um you know social um and uh mindful uh, justice as part of our practice and um activism as part of our practice not in the ivory tower so the more years that have gone by i have found an opportunity to create many villages um to quote Elaine, um, of very different sorts that are very expansive and supportive. And I also think that um, as we become, first of all, I, I feel with the clinical license, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, there's a freedom to incorporate and encouragement to incorporate new learning and new wisdom. And it behooves us to continue to expand and grow and to respect um, the fact that we are developing spiritual beings and and uh, so forth. So I, I think this idea of incorporating fundamental training is wonderful. And I also think that there's space for people who are already licensed clinically to, to really deepen and add breadth to their training and practice and to combine Buddhist psychology with dynamic psychology in our work. Um, so I want to say that. Uh, 
Uh, Stephanie, did you have something you wanted to share? Well, just speaking to that question of earning a living, uh, which is uh, an important question. Uh, and I feel like I've tested that in many ways, both prior to uh, my clinical work and after my clinical work, because even with the doctorate and the stature of my credentials, I'm still doing cutting edge work that uh, would horrify some people who are more <laughs> traditional. Uh, and I feel that one of the routes to credentialing myself to do this cutting edge work is my capacity to articulate that. And so I feel like cultivating the skill of writing and publishing uh, is worthwhile. Uh, I personally love to write. That's what uh, my undergraduate work was in, was literature. Before I became a neuroscientist, I was focusing on literature and writing, uh, which is still a passion of mine. But the clinical writing that I've done that doesn't exactly come from that same passionate stream, though I've tried to weave it in. Uh, creating a literature that describes this fusion, I, I feel like Lourdes uh, modeled that in the case studies that she delivered. Mm -hmm. And finding publishing outlets, which actually are easier these days because there's so many online outlets. And uh, if, if you can get published, preferably by a publisher, but self-publishing is not a dishonorable route if it's done properly. Um, but the books that I've written document the fusion that I've developed and that I continue to evolve. And therefore, that adds stature to what it is that I do. So I encourage people who want to make a living doing cutting edge work in this field to also learn how to write about it in a way that communicates intelligently and because I have such a commitment to grassroots uh, globally as well. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's another, I, uh, I mentioned before, but the possibility of creating a journal for this association where we can share our writing with each other and also video and audio as well. Um, okay, so we've gone a little over, but uh, um, now we can shift to the somatic attunement. So Stephanie's gonna lead us in a somatic attunement um, and then we'll have our break for lunch and then at one o'clock will be the buddhist chaplaincy panel um, so uh, stephanie if you'd like to go ahead thank you thank you john so whether you're seated or in standing um, allow yourself to make contact with the soles of your feet. You may close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. So bring your awareness, your attention into the soles of your feet. Allow your arms to swing just slightly uh, until the pendulums find their neutrality and your fingertips orient towards the earth. Soften your knees, soften all your joints. And let's just roll the shoulders back and forward a few times so that we begin to loosen up and connect with our bodies. Soften your face. And in your consciousness, please direct your awareness to the area right under the mound of the big toes. There's a field there, a connective tissue field. Just bring your pointed consciousness to that area. And notice what happens when you do that. And imagine from that area, 
that roots are growing between your connective tissue and the body of the Mother Earth. And in that wonderful field of connection, allow the body of the mother to be the flesh that you feel with the soles of your feet and allow the four corners of your feet now to wrap around the flesh of the mother. And let's just breathe into that rootedness Three breaths with the exhalation twice as long as the inhalation. Now I want to invite you to bring those fingertips right under the collarbones. So at the beginning of the clavicle, there's the knobby entry point of the collarbone. Slide your fingertips just under that knob on both the right and left sides and don't worry which fingertip. In fact, it's absolutely fine that there might be several fingertips touching into the field right under that collarbone in the connective tissue. And allow your sensory experience to communicate to you the response right under the clavicle rebounding into your fingertips. So let's pay attention to our breath as we track that sensory event. Or perhaps you're noticing an expansiveness across your chest. The sights on the map of the body that was transmitted to me are called the wings of the heart. They allow us to find spaciousness and even contentment. One of the names of this site is contentment in all experience. They widen the entire channel of respiratory function and they open what's behind on the back the back door to the heart. So allow yourself to feel how the sensory systems in your body, all of them, respond to this touch, to the spreading of the wings of the heart that let us know that our nervous systems have the capacity to find spaciousness in the midst of a compression. And staying in that grounded relationship to the mother through the soles of your feet. Softly and gently let your hands float away from the clavicles and bring the palms of the hands together at the heart level to strengthen the heart opener. 
and let there be palpable contact between the pads of all the fingers and the palms of the hands. Not pressing, but intimately in physical relationship. This is called an inju, which is a form of mudra. This invites the central channel to be activated. It turns on what's called the main central vertical flow, the central channel of alignment. Breathing into that. Three breaths. And then when you're ready, letting your motoric impulse draw your hands apart, letting them float down to your sides, slowly opening our eyes. To feel the fullness and the beauty of this moment with gratitude and appreciation for coming together. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stephanie. And that was beautiful, thank you. Okay, so uh, we will now take a break for lunch and whatever uh, feels good for you. And then we'll come back for the one o'clock Buddhist chaplaincy panel. Um, and just as a reminder that the sessions are being recorded and they'll be made free, available free uh, after the conference, um, as well as links to people's um, writing and other resources that panelists have provided that um, there'll be a, a, a package of things that everyone will get that includes those things. Um, Actually, including also Stephanie has offered a uh, resource, more, more detailed resource on acupressure um, and in particular dealing with respiratory uh, issues. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to provide these resources uh, to my colleagues. And there's a packet uh, with very clear uh, charts. Uh, but feel free to contact me with questions. I look forward to continuing these relationships. John, will we have access to each other's contact information? And mm -hmm. yeah, um, I will. Yeah, I, I want to create a directory uh, of everyone at the conference who would like to share their information, and so I will. I'll send an email out asking for people's permission. Um, and then, yeah, so everybody's name and contact info and um, links will be provided as a directory. Yeah. Did you also ask for publications and so forth? I think I missed that. Um, the, the goal is at some point to get a journal going. Um, we could, I have my, for my podcast, I have a website that has a blog that could be a temporary space. Um, so say, for example, what Lourdes wrote today, that could be shared. Um, on that space. Um, would that work for you, Lourdes? Sure. Yeah. I have to, I and have... I, I would like to include the climate change and consciousness community if uh, possible in the sharing. And I'm happy to tell everybody more about that global movement. Right. Well, definitely, yes. I, I would like to hear that a lot, please. And that will be, um, Stephanie will be giving a talk on Sunday night where she's talking about the global change and climate change and consciousness. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. great. Okay. Thank you again, everybody. And have a good lunch. Uh, and I will see you later. Thank you, John and brother, brother and sisters. <laughs> thank you.